Okay, so we are now recording. All right, thank you folks uh, for joining us uh, both here in uh, the Honors Suite and on Zoom for our second Honors Colloquium of the fall 2023 semester. It's crazy. Uh, but I'm very happy to introduce uh, my colleague and uh, boss, the Associate Provost and Professor of Management Information uh, Systems, uh, Sushil Sharma. And he's gonna be speaking to us today on emerging technology trends and management challenges in the 21st century. So I will turn it over to him and I will get out of the way. All yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's my pleasure to share some of my thoughts and insights. I am a technology person. I've been involved with the technology for the last 30, 35 years. From my background, I did my undergrad in engineering, my master's in engineering. For PhD, I moved from engineering to computer side of it. And initial part of my years, I developed softwares, many of those database applications that you see today, and then later on got my into academia. Um, so today, the, I want to share a lot more, but it's only 30 minutes. So I'll leave these slides with you so that in case later on, if you have any questions or if you want to follow it up, I'll be more than happy to provide answers too. So I'll skip some slides and some slides I'll mention for a few seconds and some slides I'll expand a little bit depending upon your interest. You're not uh, advancing. <coughs> hmm. Nope, 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 nope. There we go. For some reason I had to click on it again. Which one? the uh, the right button. We'll okay. Advance it. Okay. So this is what everyone can relate to. This is what we are living in, right? Wherever in the world you travel nowadays, what you need is just one gadget, and then you are all over. You can do your office work. You can do your class work. You can talk to your friends and family, and you can get the entire education delivered. So what you are doing is life is on this, what we call laptop, or you call it this way. So there is a, some part which is uh, mixed now. So the personal life, community life, professional life, all these are basically now, as you can say, the family life have merged together into one gallery, right? Each one of these could be a topic for discussion and a lot of insights and complexities involved. But let's understand here, this is what the world we are living in today. This is the slide which I wanted to show you. This is where I began my journey. When I was, uh, when I was a student, undergraduate student, the computers at that time were the size of this classroom. These were mainframe computers. Oh, yeah, I gotta do it on there. Yeah, uh, sorry. So these <clears throat> mainframe computers were, you know, the big computers. And as a student, we were supposed to um, type our programs into those punched cards and mm -hmm. hand over to the person who was responsible to operate the computer. And he will run those cards and give me input back or feedback and based on whether the program ran or not, again, you go through. So from mainframe, the journey came to call mini computer, workstation, laptop. And now you can see this is where we are all. I'm sure you're also hearing nowadays that or you are using nowadays is variable, right? You're the smart. Ones. So the journey of evolution of computing has come from mainframe <laughs> to the variable gadgets that we have today. This is where I want to introduce this the terminology, which you all are aware of. So when I was growing up, and when I started working in the companies, most company had to acquire what we call hardware and software. So they had to have a physical computer, bigger or smaller and then run some of the software tools to work for some application, be it a payroll processing, be it anything. So that concept ran till early 90s, and then this word came called cloud computing. 
This is now the terminology we use every day, that everything is on cloud. So let me give you a $1 question and ask you. So you go to amazon.com, right? You buy some stuff. Where is the server? Where does this transaction happen? What do you think when you type it here? Where does the transaction take place? Probably to the cloud. Where so where is that going? cloud? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So cloud is nothing but a series of these servers. And these servers exist in all over the world. Many times this server may be just in Dallas, right? The one which you are operating based on your IP address. And that server is trying to meet your shopping needs, right? But these series of servers are interconnected all over the world. So that cloud concept changed that the whole thing that you don't need to own hardware and software. It is third party. Somebody has set up some server or some computer. Everything is resident there. I don't need to worry to acquire it. And I don't need to take care of security side of it or management side. So cloud has become now a big word. But let me introduce now the next word, which is becoming more important now. <laughs> Have you heard of this? Um, yeah, I got it. Edge, edge computing. Edge. Have you heard of this? Edge computing, fog, view computing. So what is the problem? If I'm in cloud and I'm trying to buy stuff from here, and you said that the server is, let's say, Seattle. I said Dallas, but let's say it is in Seattle, Amazon headquarters. There's a communication time which is taking from here to Seattle. So these are series of these servers interconnected, but there's a time taking. Now, because of the time taking and because of the processing power of gadget, your phone, sometimes your transaction takes more time and it doesn't complete it. So the researcher and scientists thought, let's reduce this communication time. So let's divide this cloud computing into another layer called fogs. These are now, these servers are distant, another layer fog, and then edge. Which mean now those servers, which initially was a concept direct between the gadgets and the servers is now put into another two layers, fog and edge. And edge computing will give you spontaneous response as if it's happening there on your gadget, on your smartphone. So these, again, each one of these concepts I can go on you know, for days and days. As I said, I'm a technology person. I taught 35 years technology and each one of them in detail. And many of these tools, I was also on the developer side. But let's, for this class, understand that there are cloud, fog, edge. Now we are talking about quantum computing. You know, the computers we use, uh, they are based on computing principle, what we call bits, zero and ones. So although we type, but everything gets converted into zero and ones. Right? Now this is zero and one. Are, so basically, which means they could only be two states, zero and one. But now the quantum com computing concept that there could be eight different states, not just zero to one. They can be together zero and one. So the quantum computing principle already have produced the prototype. In future, you will have quantum computers, which will be 100 times, a 1,000 times faster than the present computers. Have you heard of this? 5G, everybody knows, right? Now we are heading on. 6G products are out, right? Everyone has 5G. No one has 60. I have 60, right? I have 60. So 6G you have, which means you can go with a terabyte internet speed. So we are talking about gigabyte per second. Now it will be terabyte per second. So again, think of the power of your smartphone, how fast it would be, and what all you can do just with the one click of your smartphone. Hard drives. We were talking about this flash drive, right? A couple of years back, we say one gigabyte, 10 gigabyte, 100 gigabyte. Now we are talking about 100 terabyte, which means for the entire life of your family, 
entire life of your family, their pictures, their all archives could be just in one drive, which you can carry in your pocket. So you don't need to do anything with computer or go to those big albums any point in time. I do tell my students in my futurism class that when I was a kid in the 90s, the hard drives cost basically $1 a megabyte. Yes. So a 100 yes. megabyte hard drive was 100 bucks back in like 1994. Which yes. Like 500 yes. Bucks yes. Now. Great. So this is a new thing. Everyone knows about Wi-Fi, right? What do you think is a Wi-Fi? Right? It's a new one. <laughs> Wi-Fi is that right now, if my you saw on campus, there are certain what we call hotspots, which mean the, the, the device that you have, which receives the frequency signals. If it is closer within the range, you get the Wi-Fi signal. If it is, if your router is far away, some corner of the home or building, then you say, oh, the signal is poor. Now they're saying, let's not forget about the signals available on the router and switches. Let it be in the lights. So these lights can act as a camera and also can the internet speed provider. So that is called Wi-Fi. So this is actually, again, prototypes are out, but soon you would have now tremendous amount of speed available for your communication and processing. Some of these you must have heard of augmented reality and virtual reality. Have you heard of this Google card box? Have you tried Google card box? Five dollars. You just go on Amazon, buy your Google card box, and then put like your glasses. And then on your smartphone, you can run any. So you want to visit Dallas Museum, that app, everything as if you are in the museum, right? Yeah, I have an Oculus. You have. So <laughs> you have all these. All those experiences where you can immerse yourself is like virtual reality. A couple of years back, I was traveling to Finland. And before going there, I wanted to just get an experience. Like, which, what is that town kind? And they have put the entire town as a virtual reality, which basically means that you could just go and see, oh, this is the bus stop. This is the building where I'll be. This is the college. The entire city. It's a very small city. It's not a big city. <laughs> but still. I could get a feel of that as if I'm there. So you have a virtual reality. And now they are saying you can also augment it. So while you are seeing it, you can put your flag in or some information. So which basically means it's a real time. And nowadays you can use these headsets to create all those experiences of virtual reality, augmented reality. And when you combine them together, it's called mixed reality. Chat GPT, I don't want to talk about it. It's a talk of the town. It's a talk of the town, right? Everyone is talking about it. Uh, so actually, this is another area where I, I sometimes write small pieces in the popular magazine as a fictional piece, and many of them are happening now in reality. In early 90s, I wrote, that uh, in the future human, you have to really find out whether it's a human or it's artificial intelligence, human. In fact, believe it or not, I was traveling in Seoul, Korea airport. And while I was looking, I was just uh, looking for this uh, connecting with the next flight. Somebody tapped me on the tap and she looked at it. And here was a robot. And the person immediately said, oh, what are you doing? And I got scared like, all of a sudden. I said, oh, I'm great. What flight are you looking for? This flight. Oh, that is concourse number this. Do you have some time? Why do you want to do shopping? I can take you to that. So as is like a real human being, <coughs> all these what we call artificial intelligence servers you have seen of various types of it, whether in restaurants or others. So you can even, in fact, future. I'm, I wrote a fictional piece 10 years back and I'm knowing now that it's going to be available. So if you want to be a doctor, you don't need to go to the university. There'll be a chip. You can embed your chip with your brain. You're a doctor, right? Right now, think of if you're Google. Dr. Google is embedded into your brain. And Dr. Nakashian asks you any question, right? Nowadays, whenever you want to answer any question, you look for help in the Google. If Dr. Google is embedded into your brain, 
You can answer all questions, right? Hey, that's convenient. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> of course. So you can have the brain uh, implants. <laughs> Uh, so already the, again, they are uh, scientists are experimenting this brain computer interface. It has a double purpose. On one hand, those people who have some, you know, the, they had lost some limbs in wars or in some of those cases, they can augment it and work like a, a complete human. Already we are experiencing life like virtual assistants. So many times you make a call and other side they are not the real human. They're all virtual assistant. Hypersonic uh, airliners are entering at the same time. So now in future, you may go from Europe to US in 20 minutes. So you have a breakfast appointment in Europe and come back for the lunch here. Uh, zero scale supercomputers. So you can see 1 million times more powerful than the fastest supercomputer today. I did a small experiment and you would be amazed. Do you know what supercomputer is all about? No. So you may think of in your mind that there is a one big machine, very high processing power. No, it's again small, small computers interconnected with each other. And this is called distributed computing. So what I did is when uh, a colleague of mine um, at Ball State, he had this interest that he would say that after four years when we have the new computers given to the faculty and stuff, he would ask for that, why not you give those computers to me? Um, and those old are, are there, he will put together into what we call cluster. And that cluster computing power is so high and it became so high. Students loved it to be part of the project as an independent study of you know, doing experiential learning. And later on, that cluster was joined to another cluster at Stanford and many other places. So for a genome kind of a big project, when you need a tremendous amount of power, computing power, these clusters act like a supercomputer. So it's not a one device. All right, 3D printing. You already have seen our Andrew going around and sharing with you, he hides something, you know, some of those uh, 3D made, uh, Cartoons. Nowadays, now you have 3D printed organs. So you can actually just design. So in Indiana, there's a small town called uh, Warsaw, which is the orthopedic capital of the world. They make these with a lot of artificial intelligence. And you see that while they're designing like in the real organ, and then one just click button just starts manufacturing and just printing it as if it's real. That's the next level where we are going heading to. Artificial intelligence. So we are saying that right now we are here, less than human. By 2040, we'll be equal to human. And what? It'll take over, which means now there's a very scary thing. Already it is happening. Some of the action taken by the artificial intelligence-based tools are beyond humans. And then you wonder, like, what made this tool to think beyond and why? So already that's a kind of a little scare. You must have heard of this word now, IoT, everywhere, Internet of Things, which basically means all these devices can talk to each other. Yeah. Your phone can talk to your thermostat, thermostat can talk to TV, TV can talk to air conditioner because of this internet of things, um, which is a, again a great, right? So when you go, as soon as you go in a home, the sensor puts the light on for you in the room. And then depending upon your choices, puts the temperature, what temperature you feel comfortable or set the music. And when I walked to the different room, I had a little prototype in my home in India. It's called Intelligent Building. So when my daughter walked in the room, it'll play different music. When my wife played, uh, came in the room, it played different music. When I went there, it played not only music, but even the paintings are the, you know, the things you can do. So it is so customized. And those are the things now becoming common. I won't get into much of this, but let me tell you that organization system we are developing. There was a time when we thought we'll develop software only for payroll. 
Now we are doing application for the entire enterprise. So all the enterprise is called ERP system, enterprise resource planning system. Some of you may, you know, maybe at this stage, not that much familiar, but I leave it there at this stage. Similarly, supply chain management. So when you go to Walmart and if Walmart person says, oh, it's not in the, you know, in this aisle, this stuff, well, you can get it four o'clock. And you see why four o'clock? Well, wherever they are, those are in the chain, whether in the truck or whether downloading in the warehouse or the store, you have a real-time information. So everything nowadays is stepping into real-time information. I'll skip some of this. Um, so what is happening because of this IoT and AI combining? You have the smart system, the one which I was mentioning, like a smart home, which I experimented. It works great. Uh, it's a huge investment, uh, but you know I I'm a proponent of IT, and sometime I experiment. So everything in the house is so intelligent. It picks up the temperature, music, painting, anything the, that you want, even the scents, even the perfume that you would like to use. Same concept is now becoming into a smart city. So if the bus is traveling in the Richmond Road, it can immediately send a signal to you and you can again take the action accordingly, whatever. So the whole city and the traffic, how much is the traffic getting back in the server? It helps the planners. So they are already smart cities. Singapore is one of them. I spent some time there and I actually saw how the whole city works in a, as a smart city. So there is another terminology you may hear or may have heard called industry 4.0, which basically means there was an industrial revolution starting in 17th century. Our 17th century was agriculture, then 18th century became industry, and then 19th century industry 2.0, which was more mechanical and electrical, and 3.0 when the electricity and electronic came. Um, and 4.0, as I said, merging with IoT and others. So society is evolving. So whenever you hear Industry 4.0, it means Industry 4.0 revolution. And this includes IoT and the AI as part of the major component of it. Robots and cobots, uh, you know, we certain things we can do uh, completely automatically. They're called robots. And then nowadays, in go to Detroit, many of these uh, plants, the um, manufacturing, the motor cars manufacturing plant, they have some part done by your robot, some part done by the humans, they're called cobots. So they are collaborating with each other. Humanoid, this is what I was talking about. In future, now you may have this problem to find out whether this person is real or not. Sophia is already very known. Humanoid, uh, you can Google it and find out. You can talk to <coughs> Sophia. Sophia can do anything and everything like a human. So the, what is the future? Future is something like this. Technology with all its promise and potential has gotten so far beyond human control that it's threatening to the future of humankind. And this is true already. Certain actions which you don't want to take, you know, People, um, friend of mine, and all of you are doing, using Alexa. So Alexa is home, at home, but she's listening every word what's going on. In there. So they started some arguing something. And one of them said, I'll call the police, and Alexa called the police. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's a scale. Every device that you have in your home is intelligent and it's a recording. And it can pass on that information to others, human as well as to other devices. So future is very different now. So this is the technology side I was trying to paint the picture. Now with this, this is what all these companies you are, I'm listing here, are 21st century companies. Right? They were not there. Many of them were not there at all in 20th century. So 21st century is all about globalization. Now this lecture today I'm giving it, Dr. Makashian decided he's going to put on YouTube, which means 
my domain is now going to be not local here, it's going to be global. Anybody anywhere in the world could see, right? Which is also scale now. If I make a wrong statement, it will be observed or written note, noted by so many people worldwide. So there is a push from local to now, everything is a global. Technology. Newer and newer technologies are coming, as I, I was telling, uh, you know. And with this two combined technologies and global thing have a huge impact on our lives. And one of the impact is changing and managing change. You ask uh, Kara. Kara, when she tries to bring canvas or new software to some factory, they struggle. Oh, I just like last year, I was doing Blackboard, I was comfortable. Now you brought this canvas. Tell me how it, how dissimilar, how dissimilar, how you can do this, how can this not do this? That's the first change. And many of us, oh, that good old days, this is this is not good for me. And managing change because change are happening so fast. How do you manage this change? These are the century scales. So by the time you graduate, you what made the graduate? Political science. political science. So apart from your content area in political science, you would also have to become technology expert, right? Because everywhere, wherever you would do, technology will be part of it. So what we call is these information literacy, media literacy, ICT literacy now, whether you like it or not, you have to. How to operate your phone, right? Or how to use various application tools on your phone. You have to learn. Because nowadays you go to any conference or any web webinar workshop, they say, okay, scan this, right? And then suddenly the whole application appears. Now you have to operate using that. So if you don't know, you're out of the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the, these are the different lead, um, leadership skill for 21st century. You need to be having some creativity and innovation. Think outside the box, right? Communication and collaboration. As I mentioned, social and cross-cultural skills. So nowadays you're working for the companies which are spanning in multiple different countries. Right? You don't know what cultural backgrounds of those employees, co-workers you have. What words you should be using have to be sensitive to other faith, religion, culture. So again, that is a horizon which is much different what it was in the past. Right. So that skill also you have to develop. And then, of course, uh, you know, you have to be health and environmental friendly and you need to be leading, not managing. So there are certain traits. Again, that itself could be one lecture. Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate between leader and manager? Right? And there's a lot of self-motivation and can-do attitude, right? Um, unless you develop this can-do attitude, uh, you know, you, you cannot go far. You know, when I say far, I mean basically when you want to rise in and if you experience certain deficiency, you have to self overcome on those with the candidates. Yes, I can. So, this is what the problem I was mentioning, that nowadays the challenge is working with a multicultural environment. You have to work in different time zones. Um, Sometimes my lectures, uh, they, you know, through my network, they fix it in New Zealand or in India or in some parts of uh, Europe. And that's where I, I'm, they, I'm, I'm doing this 1 a.m. 1 a.m. or 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. But that's what now you have become part of this. Flatter organization. Everything is global, as I said. You are part of the global workforce. Continuously keep learning. So now it's not that you are ending your, as soon as you graduate, you're done, no? Because the changes, they are coming so fast. You have to learn. So continuous learning is one part of it. Social networking, make a time nowadays that you also have to keep some social work going, make it friends or have friends or have family members, talk to them, meet them. You have to work in a very pressured environment. You can think of yoga or meditation as part of the therapy. Always positive, always show off your energy and enthusiasm. 
I try to. No, that was great. <laughs> well done. Came in right at about 29 minutes. I will be happy to take as many questions and uh, we'll be happy to share my experiences with you. I have, yeah, go for it, man. I have a picture that I use in my introduction to mass communication. And it's from 1985. It's from Radio Shack. Nice. And it's, it, no, it, it's really good. Yeah. It's a picture of a young man. He's wearing headphones. He's got a video camera on oh, his yeah. shoulder. He's got a VCR in front of him. Oh, there's a lot. Of, if you count it, there's 22 gadgets. And everything that's in that picture is on this. Yeah. But when I talk about all of that, where are we going from here? And you give us a, a digital. But I, I go back to this. I've been in the hospital world for the past three months with my father. And unless that strata from 60 onward starts dying quicker, this is going to be a very, very difficult world. Because the individuals that I've seen, I ain't going to learn this. I give this to my grandkids and they fix it out for me. I've been around those folks for the last three months. And there is no way any of them can survive in this environment. <clears throat> yeah, the whole uh, you know, this no, much. we get insulated. We get insulated because we're around people who do learn yeah. and they can adapt. You can get a student, you have the ability to adapt. Mm -hmm. And even I, at my advanced age, I love it. I'm like you. I, I started with a Timex Sinclair right. computer. Right. <laughs> Yes, 1970s. Well done, man. My, my point is this, like Walt, Ralph Waldo Emerson said when they said the first telegraph message had been sent from Washington to Baltimore. Yeah. He said, well, does anybody in Baltimore have anything to say to Washington? Yes. Yeah. And so it's the cultural aspect. We are not the ghost of the machine. We are the glitch in the machine. We humans. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. I, mean, I, I love this, by the way. Thank you once again. Oh, for yeah. For absolutely. Doing it for us. Um, I'm... I'm actually in about nine minutes going off to teach Brave New World. Uh, <laughs> to, to my two tours of class. And uh, last week uh, we looked at Metropolis, right? 1927, that image of the future and that image of creating synthetic life, artificial life, and not being able to tell the difference, you know. So these uh, <clears throat> these are timeless questions, you know, yeah. for poor humanity. Uh, the only question I have, and it'll have to be brief is uh, with these sort of things like smart cities, smart homes, that sort of thing. Do you think that essentially if we had to pick sort of a region of the planet that would embrace that, I personally don't think it's going to be the U.S., right? <laughs> I, I don't think that's us. I think that we're not going to be the first into that into that pool. Um, do you think there is a part of the world that will, that will kind of embrace that idea of creating like a smart city yeah. before us, or do you think it will be us? In... Um... In Asia, yeah. they are doing it for a number of reasons. Here, there are a lot of approvals you need it like privacy. Right. It's one of the big things here, but not in South Asia. Yeah. They can, you know, take your pictures anytime and put it anytime, and there's right. no privacy concern at all. Mm. So the privacy invasion is a huge issue here, ACLU and various other things will get involved. Smart city, a good example is Singapore. Yeah, you go there and you sit in a room and you can watch the entire city operation, visually and also electronically. That how the data is getting collected, how it is going to be passed to the next. How the different agencies are working together, smart government, smart cities, intelligent buildings. All these are good prototypes already happening. We do it here, but I think we cannot implement because of the much more complexity is involved yeah. and more democratic you are, less possible to implement such things. The more authoritarian you are, you can force it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's kind of what I, that's what I figured. Yeah, that's what I was. Uh, all right. Well, let's say uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And our uh, next colloquium will be in a little over two weeks. Dr. Alexander, our new president, uh, will be speaking to us on October 19th on a topic I need to look up again because I have forgotten the title. Uh, but you'll be getting more information uh, from us and on that. Here, and no, it'll be in 217. Yeah, we'll have a little bit more space. All right. Thank you very much, folks. Take care, Zoom.